listening to the Small Town Queer podcast produced by Tweed Regional Museum in northern New South Wales, Australia. Follow us as we uncover and explore Tweed's rich queer history from the early 1900s to the present. The museum has collaborated with LGBTQIA community members to collect, share and preserve the histories of Tweed's many and varied queer voices. We wish to recognise the generations of local Aboriginal people of the Bundjalung Nation who are the traditional owners and custodians of the land on which we are recording this podcast today. My name is Emma Shield. And my name is Erica Taylor and we are the curators of the Small Town Queer Digital Project and Exhibition. Hello, on today's podcast, we're talking to Uncle Ian T. Cozy Gray. T. Cozy is a historian and curator, activist, radical fairy, and a 78er, having marched in the first Mardi Gras in Sydney. T. Cozy moved to the Northern Rivers in the mid 1970s, which he considers his tribal and spiritual home. T. Cozy has helped to found many Northern Rivers community and social groups, including the Radical Oz Fairies, Tropical Fruits, and more recently, the Older Lesbian and Gay Association, which is a queer elders support group. T. Cozy is also a community historian, having co-curated the Tropical Fruits Queer History Project and the Northern Rivers Queer History Project with his longtime friend, Peter Mitchell. And in 2017, T. Cozy curated the exhibition, Lismore Has a Diverse Past, shown at Southern Cross University. Welcome, T. Cozy, and thank you for joining us for the museum's first ever podcast series. My pleasure to be here. First, can I start by asking you, as we're asking all of our interviewees, how do you identify as a small town queer? Wow, that's an interesting question because I don't think I ever thought of myself as a small town queer. Um, but the truth is, since at least full time 92, I've been living in a small town. Uh, near Nimbin actually, or mm -hmm. the, on the outskirts of Nimbin, uh, and have been a queer person all my life. So I am a small town queer in that sense uh, of living in a small town. And my, my major centres around the Northern Rivers were Lismore and Byron Bay and Mwurumba, where mm. I spent, spent my time. And you've always, as I said in your introduction, have a, you've always had this strong connection to the Northern Rivers. You consider it your spiritual and tribal home. Well, initially I went to what was called the Aquarius Arts Festival, uh, run by the Australian Union of Students at different universities. I went to the 72 version in Canberra, and that was sort of my first connection in a way with a a large hippie organisation, because there was a lot of hippies hanging out in Canberra over the summer. Uh, a lot That's of them were university I didn't know students. That. And that was the precursor to the Aquarius Festival. Following two years later, the same festival, uh, they decided to put it on in a rural area and it ended up in Nimbin. And for those of, our, uh, those of our listeners who maybe aren't familiar with the Aquarius Festival, can you give us a little bit of a history? Yeah, look, my understanding is, because I actually didn't make it to the Aquarius Festival, okay. I ended up uh, in Nimbin the year after, uh, in 1975. But the festival, so, so as I said, the, um, the Australian Union students decided that they would have a rural festival and they attracted two gentlemen, um, Johnny Allen and Graham Dunstan to go looking around the country uh, because the festival would be in a different capital city every two years at mm -hmm. a university. Uh, and they ended up in the Northern Rivers region. I think they talked to people in Mullumbimby and then Nimbin and in Moolumbar and then settled on Nimbin. They called a meeting of the town of Nimbin and 100 people turned up. They had no idea what they were saying yes to, but they said <laughs> yes. We're a dying dairy town and uh, this sounds like a great thing. Sometime later in 74, um, thousands of young, uh, mostly probably university students, mm -hmm. but also uh, just young alternative hippie type people turned up in the Northern Rivers. And it's had an everlasting effect. I mean, you can still feel the influence today and people I think still are drawn to the Northern Rivers because of the, the counterculture that exists here, which is now really part of the culture, which is one of the great things about small town queer, is I feel like it is centering 
those people, particularly those people who are queer or LGBTQI plus within that community. Um, and until recently didn't really, I think a lot of people aren't really aware of the history, the queer history that existed in the Tweed, but you probably did because you've been working um, on the gathering and curating, collecting the history, the queer history of the Northern Rivers for some time now. Well, that's true. And, uh, and I mean, the reason I ended up coming to the Nimbin Northern Rivers area was because uh, I had a, a gay school friend um, who I kept in contact with after school and he teamed up with seven other gay men from Melbourne and Sydney and, and they decided to go back to the land and they bought a block of land out the back of Nimbin mm -hmm. uh, to create a commune. And uh, they were having trouble with the weed inspector in 1975 and they, <laughs> Rob rang me up and said, come up and help. Uh, we've got 450 acres and hung out with them. And I discovered that there was a small but fairly hidden LGBTIQ community in the mm. area, mostly um, based in um, Lismore. Lismore. But I also heard about this place called Mandala. For our listeners who maybe haven't visited the Small Town Queer website yet, uh, T. Cozy has authored an article all about Mandala and the Radical Fairies, which we'll talk a little bit more about soon. I just wanted to uh, first ask you, though, what got you interested in, in intentional or community li or communal living? Yeah, look, it's an interesting question, and I often ponder. Uh, I mean, I grew up in quite a communal family. Um, there was all of the, the family and extended family events seemed to be in our home, and, our, and we spent lots of time on holidays with huge mon bunches of family and extended family. So I think I really liked that whole tribal communal family thing. Uh, so when I heard about the counterculture and the back to the land movement, I was very drawn, uh, seeing if that was for me. And I spent a little bit of my um, early life uh, in the country, visiting friends of my father's, uh, my dad's uh, old army mates really, and I thought, oh yeah, I like, like being in the bush. And you stayed. Part of uh, your time living in the Northern Rivers has been about spending time at a place, a very special place called Mandala, which we understand is the first gay commune or same-sex commune in Australia, is that correct? Yeah, look, very interesting story, Mandala. Uh, David Johnson was uh, a man who decided to leave the city life uh, and his work in TV production and uh, plays and music and... Uh, came to the Northern Rivers, um, and you can read a bit about his story, uh, and searched around for some land and uh, established uh, Mandara, Dala, Mandala, a gay man's commune, he called it at the time, uh, just out the back of Yukai, and uh, he bought a couple of hundred acres. Uh, I think there was, there was only a banana shed there. Uh, and he started connecting with both the local queer community and people further afield that he knew from Sydney and Melbourne and Brisbane uh, and and they started visiting um, and, and and they were um, mostly gay men and some lesbians drawn to the counterculture movement, alternative lifestyle, the idea of growing your own veggies and uh, living off the land. It's interesting I did some research for uh, the Small Town Queer exhibition on women's only spaces and lesbian culture within within the area. And also there is this connection between gay liberation, feminism and environmental ideas. So it seemed like there was this cross section of lots of interesting ideas in the 70s, which came up here with the Back to the Land movement, the Aquarius Festival, and has continued to draw people to the area. So at Mandala, how, I mean, how did it all work for people that aren't familiar with communal living? Were there permanent residents or was it a place where you could have respite or were there activities and workshops? Well, look, in the early days, it, it, there were, it was just David and uh, lots and lots of visitors. And as time progressed, uh, some of the people decided to stay more uh, longer term. And so over the years, there were always one or two permanent visitors uh, mm -hmm. and, then, and then one or two people who were living there full time uh, and then the more temporary visitors. And so he, he encouraged that and more people came to visit. Well, that was going to be my next question is how do people hear about Mandela? Was homosexuality still criminalised at that point? Yeah, certainly homosexuality was a criminal offence mm. uh, up until the 80s. 
middle middle late eighties. Um, but yeah, it was a space. So it was touted as a space where um, queer people could come and feel safe, uh, able to uh, sort of express themselves and uh, experience alternative living as well. But mm -hmm. but with like-minded people, because I, I've been very interested in the visibility of queer people in the hippie um, communities in the. 70s and 80s and, and they were not very visible. I mean, I haven't really been able to find out much that happened in a queer sort of way at the Aquarius Festival, for instance. So Mandala was a unique place. There were also some women who came to the area uh, in the late 60s and early 70s, uh, some lesbian women who were um, fleeing maybe marriages that were not working for them and, and bringing their children up here and they opened up their homes uh, as a place to spend time. That's right, and we were fortunate to uh, meet one of the women behind A Slice of Heaven, which was one of those mm. properties that you're referring to. And interestingly, she gave that reason that you just did about, um, and it actually was a case of her partner relocating up here with the children, looking for a different life. Um, but also it was a place, as she explained to us, where women could be together safely because in a lot of parts of Australia, it was still, you'd still get a raised eyebrow or a strange look if two women tried to book a hotel room together. Mm. Whereas if they could come to a slice of heaven or a place like Mandala when it was closed off just mm. for women, as you say, they could express themselves freely. Mm. Um, and obviously it was a safe place for particularly a lot of the men because there was this constant threat of the law mm. as well as social stigma. Yeah, and look, it was you know those heady days and days of free love, sex, drugs, and um, long hair, and uh, <laughs> and you could be naked in the bush. Um, ticks, of course, and the <laughs> leeches were still there waiting, whoever you were. Uh, so that was a bit of a shock for some of the city folk. I bet. Um, but part of the experience is yeah. learning how to deal with nature. Yeah. Um, and. What was a typical day like at a Mandala retreat or just living on the property? What were the expectations if you were going to stay there? Yeah, well, look, um, for those living at Mandala, I mean, there was the routine of communal meals mm -hmm. and uh, there were large vegetable plots, uh, so people were engaged in growing vegetables. There was the, the routine maintenance of uh, looking after a large piece of land with weeds in this crazy climate where things grow so quickly. Then there were regular gatherings a couple of times a year where um, people would come from far and wide to spend time. And that's when uh, it would be uh, a time for workshops and activities and fun and games. Um, we used to have gay Olympics and do maypole <laughs> dancing. And, and we sort of took a whole bunch of rituals from the sort of counterculture from, and from the oh. Druids. Some and Eastern philosophy some in there. Indian Eastern yeah. philosophy and put all that together. So a day was uh, sometimes just uh, sitting around, sipping chai, talking. Connecting you know. to one another, yeah, connecting yeah. to the land. Yeah, we'd go on outings and bushwalks and down mm -hmm. to the beach. And what was that like when you ventured beyond the boundary of the property into the township or to the coastal villages? Yeah, look, it was an interesting process, like even just going to shop in Mwollomba, you know, you had to straighten up a little bit. It was, some people didn't bother, they felt comfortable to be out. And if you were with a bunch of friends as well, you know, you, you had the strength of numbers and so uh, you uh, could go out and about. Um, uh -huh. so, so, yeah, people found that really uh, liberating as well. And I mean, uh, my experience has been that in some ways country people are probably much more accepting. They don't necessarily want to know the details of they're not going to judge you. Yeah, you right. feel quite as judged as in the city sometimes. Well, that's very interesting because that was going to be one of my mm. questions. I mean, I know you said that you had spent time certainly in the country growing up, but you did live in Sydney for a little while before you moved up here, yeah. where you were certainly involved in a lot of the early gay liberation groups. Um, and of course, you marched in the original first Mardi Gras. What was the scene like in Sydney? How would you compare the two lifestyles if... If I can call well, it look, that. in one way they're very different because uh, life in the, in a small town as a queer 
you, were, you had to be pretty careful and closeted and, and choose your friends and your allies. But as I say, if you were with a group of people and, uh, and particularly people who'd been here longer, then they knew the traps. And, but you know, not the same as the city where in the early 80s, uh, the gay lib movement was in full swing and uh, suddenly there were um, queer publications and there were venues and there were endless different groups catering to every sort of interest you know, theatre or cooking or whatever. So you didn't have that same uh, multiplicity of, of organisations or groups, and not, venues, not in the early yeah. days anyway. So oh. everybody uh, was tucked together. I mean, in, in the early 80s, uh, a man called Michael Bray opened a restaurant at the first queer restaurant, openly gay restaurant in Lismore called Double Dutch. That was a bit of a home for people. Uh, the, everyone was welcome and so the straight people who felt comfortable and uh, were welcome. In a way that was a great mixing because that's what in some ways our story uh, of uh, slowly being tolerated and then accepted and equality often is all about um, the relationships you make, personal relationships you make with people in communities that uh, are not part of your community. So they get to know you as a person right. and realise that you're not so scary, you're not so different in some ways. And they're also interested in the differences as well. There is a, there is a queer culture yeah. and there is a lot of diversity within that culture. Mm. But uh, maybe because that culture and some of its creative output, whether that be art or writing, hasn't featured in a lot of mainstream institutions, cultural institutions, mm. I mean, that is starting to change now. Mm. We're certainly not the first um, museum to uh, put ourselves in this space. Um, but there has been a, a history and a past of really ignoring queer people, mm. ignoring their stories, not valuing them, suppressing them. Mm. Now, you've been a historian for some time now and you've already curated an exhibition I mean, how would you explain the evolution of this interest in queer culture? Yeah, well, look, I think it's partly driven by our own community saying we've had enough of being invisible uh, and we have stories to tell just like everyone else. Um, and so we're going to tell those stories. We're going to find out what they are. Uh, and because they've been often so hidden or suppressed, uh, uh, it was it's a bit of an effort find out what really was happening back in then. There were not the same records, there was not the same... Uh, we, we didn't appear in public in the same way in newspapers and radio and television. So it was much more about doing oral histories and talking okay. to people and getting their stories as well and trawling around trying to find objects, and bits of material, paper, uh, all sorts of things. Because people... There were people who were queer who didn't want to hold on to those objects, right. you know, um, were worried about, you know, being... Uh, like there used to be a thing called in the 80s bedroom raids where the police would... Ra the word would get out that there was a gay couple living in a house, say, in Lismore. Right. The police would raid them at uh, night time, uh, hoping to find two men in bed together, uh, and then they would be charged. So, uh, and those men may, may live pretty straight lives and have... So they're, they're very careful. So they weren't keeping anything that no. maybe uh, could be used. To, yeah, That's gave right. the gave yeah, the impression they had any connection to gay culture or venues or That's activity. Right. That's right. I mean, before any of the magazines, one of the only ways of getting to connect with other queer people in the country was a group called Country Network, set up mm -hmm. by a man from Dubbo, and it was all based on a newsletter and contacts in every rural city in Australia and. Right. Uh, You'd get that magazine every month and it would tell you what was going on in your area and who you could connect with and if you were wanting to, to visit people. Uh, but that was delivered to you in a plain brown envelope and uh, then some people were even very nervous about that. Um, I would imagine it was a lifeline for yeah, a lot of people. But a very important lifeline. Absolutely, yeah. particularly before social media and yeah, yeah. virtual groups, yeah. um, which there seems to be quite a flourishing scene online, particularly in regional northern New South Wales, mm. certainly when we were researching for this project, I'm sure there's 30 plus groups that mm. I've come across that just exist on Facebook. Mm -hmm. um, but before we get into those groups, I do want to talk a little bit about Tropical Fruits, mm. who've also had a really important impact. 
um, on our area, but also nationally as well too. You've been involved, you were involved in the, the early days of Tropical Fruits. Can you tell our audience a little bit about the organisation for those that may have not been to a Tropical Fruits event yet? Well, the Tropical Fruits is a pretty unique uh, regional rural um, queer group. I think mm -hmm. it's probably one of the most successful. It has a large membership base. It's been going 32 years now. It started in 1988 when a, when a, 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 a man and a woman who, used to, who were running a gay radio program at the time in Lismore said, look, we, we don't have anywhere to meet or have our dances. And everyone had gone to... There was quite a, a sort of a community and some activities in the early 80s, but then AIDS came along and... Uh, there was a lot of misinformation and, and you know, increased homophobia and uh, people went to ground really you know, mm. right until the uh, late 80s when they, st when they started to feel more comfortable to come out. So that's when the fruits started and uh, they put on parties and events. Uh, it's all run by a committee and volunteer base. Um, these days they actually own their own clubhouse in Lismore called mm -hmm. the Fruit Bowl mm -hmm. and... Um, it's a great name. It's a great name and, and that's like a, a community centre, a place to store all of our props and uh, to have uh, events and activities, movie nights, um, afternoons. Something um, for everyone and... <clears throat> All ages, yeah. which is what I, I really love about the community, is everyone is involved, everyone is included. Mm. We were sort of doing inclusivity before it became a policy. I mean, yeah. you know, that a lot yeah. of uh, institutions and governments are now really taking seriously and incorporating into their governance mm. and their human resources policies. This is the great thing about the community, and you've touched on this um, several times, is that if it didn't exist somewhere in the mainstream, then the community built it for themselves, yeah. whether yeah. that was Tropical Fruits yeah. or, for example, the Australian Gay and Lesbian Archives, who have mm. been wonderful in donating a lot of their time and sharing many of their records, including the papers of David Johnston uh, and several other important people from the community, which feature in the exhibition. Mm. You're also involved with the archives. Can you tell us a little bit about why it's so important to our community for to to have these these organisations and these places that we can gather, but also mm. curate and record our history? Yeah. Well, look, as we were saying before, our history has often been hidden uh, and or suppressed, uh, and so a lot of the early activists in starting back 40 years started to realize that if we didn't collect uh, the material that told our own stories ourselves then they wouldn't be collected you know major libraries and art museums were not doing that back in the 70s and 80s so they started the archives and it was for many many years in people's back uh, yards in the sheds, sheds and under houses yep. and boxes and things uh, but anyway they've progressed to uh, having a home for the last 15 years uh, in Melbourne. It's a national le uh, lesbian gay archive. Mm -hmm. uh, and they're just about to move into a purpose-built pride centre paid for by the Victorian government, and that'll be their new home. Um, That's fantastic. And, and they'll be really up-to-date archive. Yeah. And they've got a, an amazing collection, you know, memorabilia and um, people's photographs. records, yep. photographs, videos, um, just for this oh, project, history. just going through David Johnston's, I mean, mm. papers, I think there was something like seven, seven boxes mm. there, and I think only made it through two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, he you know, had a very um, rich life, and he was involved in lots yeah. and lots of um, organisations and, and groups aside from Mandala. But I did go through four albums, 2,000 images or so that David, photographs that David had taken or friends had taken. Mm. And you've been assisting the archive, I believe, with trying to identify some of the people in those photos or yeah. when they would have been taken. Yeah, I've spent some time down in Melbourne going through David's collection and uh, making notes. And, and mm -hmm. uh, each, each collection has what's called a finding aid. So mm -hmm. everything is documented and the more information, the better. And it's all searchable. A large amount of the periodicals and newsletters and, and uh, occasional um, information sheets 
produced by the gay community, the, the queer community in the last 40 years has now been digitised. So it's a very rich collection. What's happening, for instance, is that more and more people doing PhDs and masters at universities right. are choosing to look at uh, our queer history and our stories, and uh, they go to that archive uh, where there's a lot of uh, amazing information for them. It's a wonderful mm. resource, and again, we have to thank the community mm. for mm. for creating that space, for doing mm. that, because it wasn't being done, or if it had, if there were objects or stories. They weren't necessarily being interpreted correctly or mm. or managed in a way that they would last. But now um, they're in a and they're a proper archive as opposed to someone's back yeah, shed. And, yeah, yeah. Um, and I mean that's what one of my roles been in this setting up this queer history project in mm. the Northern Rivers is just been really uh, harassing people to keep looking in their cupboards and in their boxes and in their sheds and see if they've got anything uh, about you know their story as an LGBTIQ person. And that's the great, um, that's, that's, I mean, this is the important thing to, to make this point, is that objects tell these stories mm. as much as maybe people's journals or photographs. Yeah. So uh, we certainly, and we're going to talk about this in, a, in another podcast that's coming up that we'll be doing with the museum curator Erica and T. Cozy, where we're talking, we're looking at that process of querying the museum mm. Because before we began the small town queer process, there wasn't anything within our collection that we knew of that we could say was mm. queer because it hadn't been documented that way or looked at mm. through a queer lens. And we're going to um, explore that a little bit more in depth in the next podcast. Just to, to finish up, and we have talked about this already, but why is it important to you to collect and preserve local regional queer history well i i believe the history teaches us uh, learning about the past teaches us about you know where we are now where we will, we can be in the future and it certainly gives um lgbtiq people uh, a sense of pride that we've always been around we've That's always right. been here we've always had a story uh, and uh, it's time to bring that story out into the open and uh, not be hidden away. Exactly. Um, Representation mm. is very important. Mm. I don't know that people are necessarily saying, oh, we need to break into the mainstream. Some are, some mm. prefer not to be in the mainstream, mm. certainly in the Northern Rivers. But it's, I think it's really important that queer history is represented in, in the cultural institutions of this area, yeah. particularly for young people. I, I think that they can look at the people that um, forged a mm. way to own businesses, to achieve, to create spaces mm. like that of Mandala and the groups that you've been involved in setting up. So thank you so much for, for doing that and for continuing to collect the history because history is now, really. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And just finally, is there anything you would like to let our listeners know about that you're working on? Well, I'm continuing to work on the history of the tropical fruit story, but, but just the broader stories mm. that just keep coming up all the time in the northern rivers. And um, how can people contact you if, if they want to share their story or um, invite you over to have a look through their yeah, yeah. shed? <laughs> well, I think there's a li link uh, on the Small Town Queer website yes, I think so, to yes. the uh, Queer History Project yes. and there's an email address. You can contact the tropical fruits, just Google tropical fruits mm -hmm. and... Uh, Realising that you'll get lots of information coming up about avocados and mangoes, <laughs> but just not tropical fruit world. The yes. tropical fruit. <laughs> Google tropical fruit gay, and then That's you'll, be, right. you'll be in there. That's and, right. And I'm, I'm always looking for people to help. Uh, the sort of the mundane thing of sorting through records and digitising stuff. Yes. Uh, and doing oral histories as well, because that's really important especially the older members of the queer community in this region, yes. getting their stories down before they pass on. Um, they yeah. certainly have a story to tell. They've seen a lot of change mm. in a really short period of time. And that's where the Small Town Queer Online Exhibition here at the Tweed Regional Museum is so valuable because it's an ongoing thing and there's space there to tell your story. So I really that's encourage right. people to look at that website and uh, add any story you've got about your connection with the Tweed area. Yes, definitely get in contact with the museum if you've got a good connection to the Tweed and and with um, Uncle Ian T. Cozy Gray via the Tropical Fruits website. Mm. 
Well, thank you so much for being a wonderful collaborator on this project My and pleasure. for agreeing to be interviewed for the Small Town Queer podcast. No, no, and thank you for your work here at the museum. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Small Town Queer podcast. To hear more Small Town Queer stories, subscribe to the series and like, share and review this episode. And check out the Small Town Queer playlist on Spotify, curated by museum staff and project participants. For more information about Small Town Queer, visit museum.tweed.newsouthwales.gov.au forward slash small hyphen town hyphen queer. Tweed Regional Museum is supported by the New South Wales Government through Create Funding New South Wales. This project would not have been possible without the support and collaboration of the people of Tweed who have generously shared their lived experiences, archives and objects with this project.